distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. In my dual job as a research advisor to Her Highness, the chairperson of Qatar Foundation, and as a supervisor of Qatar National Research Fund, I receive a lot of praise and recognition, both from my superiors, peers, and customers, which I duly pass to my colleagues in QNRF, who do the work and keep the engine well-oiled and running. However, I also receive complaints, few but bitter and unsettling. Complaints come from applicants who failed to cross the cutoff line at around 20% success rate, which translates to above 80%, about 83% score. Surprisingly, and also complaints, surprisingly perhaps, from deans about too much paperwork and limitations. Some of them openly copy the Qatar Foundation president, and some, I imagine, raise their complaints even higher. These complaints, though few, but I admit are unsettling. Before going further, I would like to ask those of you who are involved in the research enterprise a question. This is the outline of my speech, role and importance of competitive research funding, reflection, success, what next, challenges, and then the Berlin Wall. Why the Berlin Wall? You'll find out. And conclusion. So, this, the question. How many of you would rather just, just get the money and be left alone to do the business? Good. <laughs> You're in good company. You will see. Success. What next? How do we find the breakthrough scientists? What research should we find? Can we spot an Einstein or an Ahmed Zweif? These are questions to ponder and perhaps we can address through the panel and also the audience. The challenge is ahead. Let me go back, get back to my question. My question implies that no proposal writing, no peer reviews, no reporting until the end, and this was really not a trick question, uh, could be could it be the secret wish that no researcher is ready to admit to? But we have in the audience a couple who's, who said that. Anyway, as we stand, research funds will not buy into that, at least research funds like QNRF. But I will come to this later. Last September, Qatar National Research Fund celebrated its fifth anniversary since its inception in 2006. The next speaker, my colleague, Dr. Abdel Sattar Altai, the director of QNRF, will inform you about its achievements and the impact on the research enterprise in Qatar, Qatar Foundation community. QNRF can be uh, both Qatar Foundation community and QNRF can be rightly proud of this remarkable achievement in such a short span of time. However, what I want to talk to you about is not to elicit more praise and congratulations, but rather, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, so rather to share with you 
my thoughts and concerns about the next five years. What research should we fund? Can we spot the Einstein or the Ahmed Zweig? Granted, the QNRF will expand to offer programs up and down the educational ladder and laterally to actively engage secondary school students across the country. However, we need to, to develop further and cast a critical look at our codes and practices. Recently, my attention was drawn to a new platform for a scientific conference called Falling Walls. It draws on the metaphor, it draws on the momentous event of the fall of the Berlin Wall and takes it as a metaphor for a conference. Scientists were simply asked, what wall would you like to break? In addition to the invited high-profile scientists, the audience include VIPs from officials involved in education, finance, and social services, and obviously, when distinguished scientists and high-profile politicians get together in a conference, the industry moguls cannot ignore and pay substantial fees to get in. One particular speaker in the conference of last November drew my attention. The title of his speech was Breaking the Wall of Research Funding, no less. How about that for a lecture? I'll come to that later. That speaker was the neuroscience professor, Richard Morris. Now, the challenge is ahead. In a world of economic crisis, instability, energy insecurity, and climate change, poverty, food and water insecurity, coupled with health problems, and recently the political upheavals in our region and beyond, Clearly, there are plenty of scientific opportunities to mitigate these problems. The challenge is to find niche areas in the unmet needs. However, with all this to consider, QNRF should not forget its priority focus on research, capacity building in Qatar. There are signs that the model we have adopted for international collaboration may reach saturation at, at the locally based institutions. Some of them are in fact turning down research proposals because of limited capacity, particularly in suitably qualified researchers. Happily, the launch of the three national research institutes based on Her Highness initiative of the Arab expatriate scientists network will hopefully alleviate this problem over time. Now the challenges, these are representations of the challenges ahead. And if you look on the left corner, there is the seven of diamond over there just peeking out. That's me. Uh, that can be explained later. And the, of course, the economic crisis, the global warm, warming, and the environment, and so on. Now, this is a quote again from our professor, the neuroscientist. Uh, First of all, a word about the neuroscientist himself. Uh, he's a professor of science, he's a, also an, a neuroscience professor, active researcher, but at the same time, uh, he is an advisor to the Wellcome Trust. Now, a Wellcome Trust is uh, a UK-based biomedical charity, the largest in the UK, and the second largest to the Gate Foundation worldwide, focused on 
biomedicine. Wellcome Trust grants about $1 billion a year, so they are much bigger than Q and Arabic. Simply put, uh, this is the, the words of the director of the uh, Wellcome, uh, not the director, the, the science advisor of the Wellcome Trust, who is quoted here. Simply put, the best way to administer a creative research environment is to find people of great talent and reasonable ambition, whatever their specific disciplines, and leave them to their own devices. Now, on this, there was tremendous applause from the audience. As being an advisor to a fund, a research fund, and an active scientist, this is by our regulations in QNRF is conflict of interest. So we have much to learn. So now you remember the first question and now it's put into context. Conclusion. Uh, again I quote from our neuroscientist who quoted at this, at the delivery of his uh, speech, a poem from T.S. Eliot. Time past and time present are both perhaps present in time future, and time future contained in time past. Luckily, we don't have to solve this riddle. Help is forthcoming from our professor who paraphrased the poem in mortal language thus. Our, as we reflect on the past, consider the present and try to build our future. So after several false starts, we could be witnessing the renaissance of Arab Islamic culture. And Qatar Foundation, Qatar as a country also, God willing, will play a significant role in it. Thank you. Now I'll call on Dr. Abdesetta to give a much more invigorating and interesting account of the QNRF achievements. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abdesetta. This is uh, the wrong. Uh, could you get the right uh, presentation? Thank you. Assalamu alaikum and uh, good afternoon. <coughs> Uh, my presentation um, is to give you uh, some details about uh, what's been happening uh, with the QNRF since its inception. But let me start by giving you an outline of my presentation. I will be talking, giving you some uh, background information about QNRF, and also I'll be talking about the, um, the, our uh, funding uh, research programs and other sponsored uh, initiatives. And um, then I will uh, zoom into a QNRF uh, research partnership and international reach. And uh, at the end, I will be talking about uh, Q QNRF impact on research. So uh, as Dr. Amr mentioned, <clears throat> QNRF was established uh, back in August 2006 and uh, um, uh, as the sole funding uh, agency in Qatar. And if I may borrow the metaphor uh, of the uh, well-oiled uh, uh, engine, running engine of QNRF, 
I'd like to uh, really point out that what we did, uh, not, in, not only that we are running the engine, but actually we had to design, construct, test run, and uh, uh, run the engine in the efficient way you, you all have uh, seen. So our, um, uh, our um, uh, mission is to advance knowledge um, and, um, 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 and education by uh, supporting original uh, uh, selected research uh, projects in all fields of science and um, at, uh, on competitive basis, and I'd like to underline this fact. And, uh, and um, uh, we provide research opportunities uh, at all levels, uh, from students to the professionals. Also, we provide um, uh, funding uh, for the public as well as the private sector. And, um, uh, and, uh, and also, we allow very important um, um, issue uh, regarding the design of QNRF is we allow international collaboration. And uh, so, as you can see here from that we cover all fields of science. So in a way you can think of us just like the eight British uh, research councils or miniature NIS, uh, NSF, NIH, and DODs and so forth because we are catering for all uh, fields and uh, disciplines of uh, science. So how did we um, get started? And I think Dr. Amr in the previous uh, um, panel, he mentioned that uh, our pilot project, we, which we started back um, in uh, sometime in um, November 2006, a uh, few months after the inception of QNRF, we launched this, uh, the Undergraduate Research Experience uh, Program, we call it Europe for short. This is really it targets undergraduate students, provides them the opportunity to do hands-on research and uh, um, learning by doing under the mentorship of the, of the primary faculty member. And uh, really, that was a very resounding, uh, it had very resounding success because we, uh, we had many, many folds than what had been anticipated uh, in our original uh, and, uh, business plans. Then we launched our flagship program is the National Priorities Program. It's a one uh, or uh, MPRP for short. It uh, targets well-established researchers or key investigators. Um, uh, we have one cycle uh, per year, and we provide quite uh, reasonable uh, funding opportunity, around one million uh, for uh, uh, projects extending for up to three years uh, duration. Um, and this is the one which is open for international uh, uh, collaboration. Then, uh, then we had um, two other initiatives uh, back in 2000. Uh, Eight. The first one is called, um, uh, in, uh, originally it was called the BNRS, Biannual National Research Survey. Actually, it was a very important uh, uh, back uh, uh, baseline uh, data information for research so that we can see the impact of QNRF in, in the research arena, uh, what is the impact of our funding. So we started collecting all research um, output since the inception, or the, sorry, since the the independence of the state of Qatar back in 1970 till now, and this is uh, updated annually, and now we have an ongoing uh, initiative with the Bloomsbury Qatar Foundation to upload all the full documents, and I think Aaron will be touching upon that uh, later on. Um, then we, we had another initiative, a sponsorship initiative, is the conference and workshop sponsorship program, and we provide opportunities for, for uh, um, um, uh, holding uh, conferences and workshops inside Qatar. And then uh, we started filling the gaps. As you can see, we had the, the, uh, the Euro, uh, Europe uh, program, and then we had the MPRP. So there are some researchers, young investigators, who, who cannot, do not stand a chance in winning grants in the bigger flagship program, the MPRP. So we launched this program. We, we give them uh, independence um, to uh, provide them the opportunity funding to establish their own independent research. So we provide uh, funding up to 300,000 uh, US dollar in funding. And um, we hope that through this uh, initiative or this program, um, um, uh, young investigators can st start producing uh, their own publications so that they will be eligible 
to participate in the, in the bigger uh, uh, program, the NPRP. Not only that, actually, uh, um, we thought uh, this is another big challenge, and I think this was also um, mentioned uh, a lot, even in the opening session, um, really to create sustainability and really to um, go deep root, uh, root in, the, in the research and creating research culture. So we opted to go to the high school level. So we call the CESREP, Secondary uh, School Research Experience Program. This provides opportunity for high school uh, kids to perform uh, research and to learn about research methodologies and, and, and so forth. This really, uh, as it turned out to be, this is the most difficult task actually. It was even harder than the other programs. And uh, may I say that uh, um, the, the issue of um, K to 12, um, now we are approaching the 12, and then hopefully we, in the uh, uh, coming years, we will go to G. So it will be 12 to G, uh, 12 to K uh, approach. Uh, then uh, some of our uh, talented researchers, they came, they said, one million uh, US dollar is not enough for funding. I have a grand idea. I have a great, uh, th this research, if you can provide me with the funding, I can give you um, uh, excellent results, good um, uh, IP rights, and so on. And um, so um, we launched this, uh, we call it NPRP, Exceptional Proposals. It is different from the, the other one, but we provide funding up to five million US dollars for, uh, for this uh, program. But it is much harder, and it has uh, a lot of screening and uh, two-stage uh, uh, application. Uh, then in the future, now you can see all these um, uh, previous uh, funding programs are investigator uh, initiated uh, 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 proposals or research. It means that they will address certain um, research areas. We have specified certain fields, but it is really uh, uh, um, uh, investigator initiated research. But in the future, we need to focus, if we need to focus on a specific critical area in research like uh, food security, like um, 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 diabetes or something at uh, expedited process in multidisciplinary, multi-project approach. This will be the big uh, thing to come from QNRF is the team uh, research uh, program and um, uh, still work in progress. Uh, let me share with you some statistics about um, uh, the, our uh, previous programs which I mentioned. Uh, actually, with this undergraduate research experience program, we, we, so far we have launched uh, 10 cycles, and we, um, we had uh, around 1,100 um, proposals submitted. Around 500 were awarded success rate is of the order of 40, uh, 42, uh, uh, 45%, and um, that's the amount of funding already uh, committed, 16.4 US dollar, million US dollar. But look at the NPRP, the staggering statistics, you know. We have only, uh, I'm sharing with you statistics about the four, uh, four um, uh, cycles, previous cycles. And um, we had around 2,000 2, um, uh, proposals submitted, and um, 411 uh, of them were funded with a total amount of uh, 345 million US dollars. And the uh, success rate is in the, uh, the order of 21, 22%. Uh, uh, the other program, the Young Scientist, because the, there are, uh, the eligibility criteria, we set time limit, uh, age limit. So we had um, uh, 43 LOIs. We already um, implemented two cycles, and um, we had uh, 22 proposals submitted, seven of them being awarded with the amount of around 1.6 million US dollars. The secondary school research experience program, now we have the uh, implemented the first cycle um, last year. Now we are undergoing this, the second cycle for this academic year. And so we have um, uh, around um, one third of the high school uh, uh, or the secondary schools in Qatar participated. And uh, that's the number of uh, uh, submitted proposals. And, uh, and the NPRP exceptional uh, is much harder, and um, so we had uh, eight uh, applications. Only six of them, they've been um, allowed to go into full proposals. 
the, these are some statistics about the, our flagship program. Um, as I mentioned previously, we fund um, research uh, in all fields, but as you can see, engineering and technology. So we are covering the, uh, this. Um, Ben covers the whole disciplines in engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical, and chemical, petroleum, and you name it. So the, the, it had the lion's share in, um, in the proposal submission as well as in, in the award. But uh, uh, followed the, next to that uh, is the uh, medical and um, uh, health uh, sciences, and then after that, natural sciences, and also social sciences is really, um, as Dr. Fethi mentioned in the previous panel, is very important and there is a big uh, um, uh, emphasis from Her Highness about uh, making um, this uh, more um, uh, proactive in, um, in, um, in funding. Humanities, we, we had uh, not many and hopefully that with, um, uh, uh, with the Northwestern and uh, uh, Virginia, we, we hope that we can improve on that. Agricultural science, also we had limited, uh, but none of the bins didn't have any application. Uh, this uh, graph shows you the, how, how um, the various bins being developed, the number of proposals submitted. And as you can see, uh, uh, everything is really move, still moving and the people would have expected that we would reach a plateau, probably in engineering or something that we are leveling off, but the rest are all on the, on the increase. Uh, this is the, uh, the distribution of the, uh, the uh, funding uh, amount per discipline. So as you can see, engineering and so on, uh, um, and technology had 42%, uh, followed by the medical and, um, uh, and health sciences, 24 and then natural sciences, 21%, and uh, social sciences, 10 and humanities, 2%. Agriculture had only one, but let me put a lot of, um, I, I'd like to underline the fact that we do fund both um, uh, basic and applied science. Actually, we have more applied science than natural, uh, than basic science. So this is uh, very important to make uh, uh, a point out of this. So uh, how did we, um, how did we implement uh, this model about the partnership um, uh, and uh, how did we manage to make that uh, international visibility? Uh, so you have, uh, you have Qatar and um, in um, Qatar you have the submitting institutions inside Qatar because we do, we do not fund individuals, we fund, uh, we fund um, institutions. And so we have submitting institutions and um, also, we allow collaborative institutions, and um, uh, from the other part of the world, uh, we only allow collaborative um, uh, institutions. And uh, normally, uh, for the, uh, our um, MPRP, the ordinary MPRP program, we put a budget limitation. Only 35% of the budget can be expended outside Qatar, and a minimum of 50% uh, efforts should be done inside Qatar. Whereas for the exceptional, we even made it more stringent. Only 20% of the fund can be expended outside Qatar, and um, uh, uh, only 35 uh, of the uh, effort uh, can be done outside Qatar. Uh, now let's see the international visibility. Here you go. So we are really... Um, um, uh, extending, uh, we are moving in all direction, the four uh, um, um, corners of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the world, of the globe. And um, let me share with you um, um, some general statistics, and I think that was also mentioned by Dr. Fethi Saud uh, during the opening session. We have, up to the fourth cycle, we had around uh, 685 uh, uh, submitting uh, collaborative institutions coming from 60 countries all over the world. This is really, I think, uh, I, I, I can say it with modesty, it's amazing for us anyway, because we never expected that we can reach that visibility in that short time. Uh, uh, now you can see in the, the different region of the world, and uh, one would expect that North America um, for the good reasons, we have the, all the, um, we have the uh, branch campuses uh, 
the hair so one would expect that we have good um, good um, number of uh, collaborative institutions coming over with the, and we added that to that uh, some Canadian institutions for um, uh, South America also we, we extended down south to South America so we have the number of uh, co collaborative institutions uh, Europe also uh, quite staggering actually this uh, coming from Europe uh, uh, more than 236 uh, collaborative uh, institution and they and we still have ongoing uh, research with many of, of these institutions the amazing thing is also the Arab world we have been very successful that we um, we enticed many of the researchers in the Arab world to find partners in Qatar and uh, and uh, the statistics uh, reveal for that uh, and also the Sub-Sahara Africa, also we had a lot with South Africa and so forth. Uh, also for other regions of the world in uh, New Zealand, um, Asia, the other countries in Asia and, um, and the Caribbeans and so forth. So you, as you can see, uh, really uh, quite, um, uh, quite an outreach uh, for international outreach throughout uh, uh, research collaboration. So. Um, these are examples of, um, of this um, uh, impressive array of international uh, renowned uh, uh, institutions we, with whom our uh, researchers or our um, Qatari uh, uh, submitting institutions are collaborating with. It's really uh, uh, giving, providing great opportunity, great exposure, uh, exposure to, to, uh, to, um, to make um, impact on uh, research and development of human capital in, in, in Qatar. Um, so now talking about impact. Uh, this is um, um, one of the uh, issues which we uh, really, um, right from the initial stage of QNRF, as you can see in the first cycle, we had zero uh, submitting institutions, uh, or we call them research offices, or probably in the States they call them Office of Research. Um, we, uh, based on the lesson learned from the first cycle, where, where we had uh, some uh, key investigators submitting without referring back to their uh, mother institutions or they are not aware, so uh, that created problems. So started, uh, starting from the second cycle, we started imposing um, um, that they should, um, that these um, uh, submitting institutions, they should um, register, they should comply to certain guidelines, they should have, um, um, and then even we pay a side visit to them to make sure that they have all the uh, necessary uh, requirements in place before we allow them to become uh, a research office. And we have now 58 submitting institutions in Qatar. That's not only the academic, because if you count the academic, they will count around 10, something like that. The rest are from the government, uh, from the private sector. I'm very happy to share with you that we have many um, uh, um, uh, submitting institutions that won grants uh, from uh, from the private sector, which is really a plus in, in, in our uh, model. So, what was the impact of uh, um, of QNRF on generating the human capital and so on? So, through the NPRP, already we are involving more than uh, uh, 1,250 key investigators. Hands on, they are all working inside Qatar and, and that number of postdocs and this is another staggering uh, uh, thing that um, uh, we have uh, 383 and if you go to the education city you go to Qatar University you see so many postdocs around and even more that we have graduate students look at that figure we have already more than 363 something graduate students most of them coming from abroad so this is a call now this has really made uh, many of the academic institutions in competition to start graduate programs and this is uh, not to mention um, um, not to mention the other infrastructure or the human capital generated we have many research assistants we have many lab technicians and we did not include that and actually I went uh, twice to Wild Cornell I remember my first visit to Wild Cornell when I see empty corridors and said my god what a waste of space. Then, next time I say, um, Dr. Khalid Mashaka, Dr. Abdel Sattar, we need more space here and there. And the same was true. 
with the, with Texas uh, with Texas A&M. They are thinking of using the parking space for more labs. This is really the impact on 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 research. Uh, sorry if I, uh, I probably I missed one very important thing is the the undergraduate students. We have fifth, around 1,500 students being giving training on on research, and also we have many uh, secondary school uh, students being trained on research. So you can see the sustainability. This is built for sustainability. So we will be uh, having um, uh, through the CESREB and then they, when they go, uh, high school kids, they go to university, they develop more and more. And I think this is a very good uh, sustainability model. Uh, now, uh, obviously, uh, why are we funding? Uh, I mean, like any funding agency would expect other things apart from creating the human capital and so on and uh, building infrastructures. Um, um, it's the publication. And as you can see that um, uh, um, now is we have, um, we call it the breakthrough curve. Uh, it will come very soon. I think within the next two, uh, uh, one or two years, you will see the, the S curve going up. But already you can see the impact uh, felt here. But one uh, interesting um, 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 probably finding, you can see that even the undergraduate uh, research experience program is already generating quality research, published research paper, and that's really something. And um, the other thing, of course, is the invention because, um, and the patents and, and so forth. So uh, what we did, and this is the, the unique thing about the Qatar Foundation, we are all together under the umbrella we are, um, of Qatar Foundation. So we, we made partnership with the QSTP and we, we initiated a very important initiative. We called it the IP management uh, initiative. So we are uh, helping the researchers who are not aware about um, how to go to, to cross the, the value of debt and to go to proof of concept and so on. So we are providing them with great opportunities to, to, uh, to take them into the commercialization. And uh, already some of our projects, our funded projects, been gen uh, generating um, uh, patents and so on. And probably if I may share with you that more, um, um, uh, we estimated that around 50% of the submitted proposals now uh, in this uh, forum were, uh, uh, were funded from QNRF uh, 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 projects, various funding programs. So the impact is, I think, is felt. The, the last is, well, the, uh, the one before the last slide, uh, you know, I talked about uh, building um, uh, this engine and designing it, and, and the biggest challenge for us is to go paperless right from the beginning, and this is an issue. Many established funding agencies, they took them a long time, you know. Uh, you all, uh, are, many of you are aware about the fast lane project and so on, and the teething problem. We were doing actually that while we were building that search engine, and it is really going, and we are uh, uh, going paperless in, in all uh, steps of, uh, of our application, and in, even in the post-award stage now. Uh, at the end of my uh, presentation, I'd like to leave you with this visionary uh, quote from Her Highness, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abdel Sattar. And uh, we will be happy to answer questions, but after the, the end of the speak, the other speakers. Uh, the panel will stay. I'll ask them to stay and answer any questions that you have. So now I call upon Professor Abdul Wahab Arusi from Qatar University, he is giving the speech on behalf of Dr. Hassan al Dirham, who is the Vice President for Research at Qatar University. Um, as his, he was a, a replacement speaker, his profile was not given to you. So I'll just go through very quickly. Professor Arusi is the Director of Gas Processing Center at Qatar University. The stakeholders in the Gas Processing Center are 15 oil and gas companies, 
and the Ministry of the Environment. The Center conducts research and development in areas pertinent to the consortium members and in line with the 2030 vision of the country. Professor Arusi is as a chartered engineer and physics, a fellow of the Institute of Mechanical Engineering and the Institute of Physics, the United Kingdom. He has published over 300 papers and successfully supervised 20 PhDs. He is one of the editors. He is on the editor editorial board of several international journals and the organizing committees of numerous international symposia. Professor Arusi has 27 years and teaching experience. 27 years of research and teaching experience. He has held uh, senior posts in both academia and industry. Please. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Absatar. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, as the chairman stated, I am uh, uh, impersonating Dr. Hassan Adiram, who's our uh, vice president for research, who was summoned to go to an, another important meeting. Our presentation on behalf of the University of Qatar is to look at the partnerships uh, for excellence, that is, partnership between the university and other entities. As I stated in the talk that I gave earlier as part of the panel, when uh, Richard Smalley was asked uh, in 2003 to name the top 10 problems that humanity is facing or will face in the next 50 years, he gave this list. And as you can see, the top four are energy, water, food, and environment. And these uh, uh, four items or four areas, they actually make up what we know as sustainability for any nation to exist, for any uh, cohort group to exist. And as such, as a university, we are engaged in addressing these issues for Qatar, for Qatar as a state and for the region. For Qatar, we have a, a special case in the sense we have a lot of energy, we have natural gas in, in plenty for, but we have some constraints or some issues such as the water is scarce with 99.99% of the where fresh water comes from desalination. This, of course, uh, is a major issue, not least because the water comes from a small gulf with lots of countries competing for the same shallow waters. We know that water and energy, uh, they're interdependent. Energy is needed to make use of the water, and water is needed to make use of the energy. So therefore, we can't address one without addressing the other. We also know that the CO2 map of Qatar is not very healthy, and that's the reasons for it. Uh, and uh, just give you a breakdown of the contributions from the different sectors uh, of the uh, CO2 uh, contribution. This is critical, uh, and uh, we need to address it now so that we don't pass on to the future generation problems. Uh, and indeed, we all know that these issues do not know boundaries. So what is needed, therefore, on behalf of the university and as a group of uh, people in the research council of the university is to have vision. And that we have. And let me remind you of what the, Nelson Mandela said about vision. Vision without action is merely a dream. And I think we can all dream, but we need the action bit. Action without vision just passes the time because you're not really coherently aligning it with the needs. But what we need is vision with action which can change the world. And this is what we really need in this state. So in our quest to develop partnerships, we are just one player in a big gearbox, if you want. We're a cog, which is uh, Qatar University. Um, the uh, other players, obviously, the whole, the big cog, the big driver is the 2030 vision, which is the national uh, vision of the state. Uh, Qatar University is a player, so are other players, and you eloquently heard from Dr. Abstar at what Qatar Foundation, through the NPRP program and other programs, are doing to stimulate 
research, to stimulate activity, to bring partnership, to make us able to do what we want to do. They are the fuel for us, the university people. So consequently, when I say others, and it's no coincidence that the color is green, Qatar Foundation is important in that respect. So we need to identify objectives, and that we did. And the idea is to grow the research capabilities that is within the university and the capacity, because obviously we need to grow what we have. To ensure strong research teaching and, and teaching nexus. In other words, we want the present generation to take on the beacon and to drive through the research needs of the state. And to that extent, we also need to engage further down the line, further upstream with schools, and that we're doing successfully through events such as GASNA competition and so on. Uh, you heard talking about K-12. We do exactly that. We work from kindergarten to 12th grade. We strengthen uh, uh, our aim is obviously to strengthen industry, community, uh, outreach and engagement to address national priorities and I've already listed the four key issues for, uh, uh, for the country in terms of energy, water, food and environment. Uh, we need to link research obviously with the society's needs and responsibilities. Uh, because you can't have one without the other, otherwise you'll end up with a raging bull and you can't control the growth and you can't make use of the growth. So we need to increase the allocation uh, of resources. We also need to harmonize and optimize the resources available to us so that we can target these resources to the needs as per the 2030 vision. Uh, and we've just been through an exercise, uh, and we are going through an exercise within the university where we're aligning our research priorities with the vision, making sure that each individual, each center, each department is doing exactly that so that we know what needs to be done if we are lacking in activity in a particular area. And where we have activity, we need to make sure it's sustainable and productive. We need to establish research clusters and centers for excellence. And as I stated earlier in the, the panel discussions, we do have some wonderful uh, centers, and I will explain to you later on or name them to, for, you, for you later on. But the, the, the need for us to create niches, that is, areas where we think the country needs to invest in, in terms of research and development, where we bring together the private sector, where we bring together the industrialists, where we bring together the government agencies, the legislators, and one of the opportunities I had today, I must quite a few people from the, uh, the, the legislation side that I need in my center, because they are the regulators that will drive through incentives for people to do research and make sure that research is actually delivering on the vision of the country. Uh, finally, is to enhance the institutional status and to uh, have a brand for us, Qatar University is a brand, is the national university. But we are not operating in isolation. We operate in a state which operates in a bigger uh, a peninsula, which operates in a bigger world. We are a global entity. We want to operate as a global entity. and We are putting every, everything in place to make sure that we are not only visible, but also visible as a partner of choice. So the Qatar University research strategy is in front of you. I won't bore you with the details. Needless to say that we want to build the organizational capacity for research. The infrastructure is critical to that. That is the human capacity, the physical capacity, the support. And uh, you will know for if you apply for any grant, it's not a, a, an easy task because you've got a lot of administrative issues to deal with. Researchers need support on that side. They need support on recruitment recruiting good people in a world where we have a uh, sort of transient workforce. It's not easy. So therefore, we need things in place to make sure that when we ask people to do research, we give them what they need to do research. And finally, we want to develop a strategic research partnership, which is basically what the talk is all about. This uh, strategic partnership, why do we need it? Well, because as any university, no matter 
which university, east or west, they will have you know, advantages or strong points and weaknesses. So because we have limited resources, we also want to increase the rate of change, at, at least accelerate the process that will yield result for us and eventually for the country and our partners, who I can see in the audience are quite a few of them. The levels of research partnership that we need to have is that it can be at the institutional level, within the university, as a research partnership, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, as well as at individual level. But we can go beyond that. We can look at the local side, that is within the state, the regional state, the Gulf states, and the international arena, which we are now engaging in quite successfully. So in terms of strategic research partnership, uh, internally with the institution, the uh, research office under the stewardship of Dr. Hassan al Dirham, we have a mechanism to stimulate partnership across the campus or the campuses, the female and the male side. In terms of national, national uh, academic uh, and industrial and government agencies, we are engaging with them through numerous activities and through numerous schemes, some of them through uh, uh, Qatar Foundation. The aim at all times is we need the industry, we need the, the private sector, the end users to give us a reality check. If our research doesn't lead to end products which they can use, then it's not worth anything. The other thing is that what we need is support within uh, the university from these end users. Either, for example, support in terms of industrial chairs, support of placement, uh, either way, staff going in both directions. These are critical to have a sustainable uh, partnership. The international and academic, as well as industrial uh, uh, partnership, these uh, usually come out of consequence of the uh, programs that you've just heard about from Qatar Foundation. They are allowing us to uh, have people knocking on our door wanting to collaborate with us, which is usually elsewhere is quite difficult. For us, it's a luxury, and we're grateful to, to Qatar Foundation for this. So the drivers for these partnerships is really the integration of resources. We would like to make use of our resources. We don't want them to sit in uh, idly and not being used, but also want to optimize their use. And we want to address not only the national issues, but the global issue, because some of the problems facing humanities are not national. They are trans-borders. They go beyond the national boundaries. The simulation, or the stimulation rather, of the market-led uh, research, this is usually uh, uh, induced by the partnership, particularly with the stakeholders such as industry. They're the ones, as I said earlier, they give us the reality check. They tell us what they need us to address as a problem. And they don't want half-baked solutions. So in terms of building partnership, this is, in our view, the way we've gone about it, is to assess the potential product and the end users of that product. Then we move on to the next stage, which is to identify the partners and the market for that particular product. And then we try to develop the long-term strategic partnership and obviously projects through that partnership. And finally, we want to encourage the creation of centers of as well as for excellence. This doesn't happen unless you have an increased participation of companies and government organizations and agencies to help or be the catalyst for these collaborations. So if you have this ingredient and you have a motivated research force, workforce, call it what you like, then the chances are you will have a successful partnership. There are some ground rules for sustainable research partnership. And the word sustainable here is critical. So many memorandum or memoranda of understanding get signed never to be looked at. So many agreement start enthusiastically with a press release only to die uh, uh, quickly within six months to a year. So we need to build this partnership based on common need and purpose for the partners. And this requires courage sometimes. 
you need to be uh, mutually, or the agreement, the partnership needs to be mutually beneficial, and as I said, sustainable. It has to be equally important to all the parties. In other words, if it's a one-way traffic, it will not work. The collaboration must also happen at management level. In other words, as a researcher, as a scientist, you have people managing you, managing the resources, the space, the funding, your activities. If these people don't support you, then you are knocking on a brick wall. It's incredibly difficult. And we want, obviously, no loss of academic freedom. If academics are not given freedom to operate, such as publish, innovate, be creative, think laterally, they're not going to be able to sustain this collaboration. And they will just quit or they die, they freeze. The variety of projects uh, and the lifetime of projects is also critical. Industry often come to you and they want an answer today, if not yesterday. Sometimes they may want, for example, an answer in six, six weeks. Some visionary, such as uh, uh, big entities, they may look for a 10-year program to develop talent, to develop with, with, a, with a low return. They may actually expect 20% return on their investment. But they're smart because they are creating for themselves a particular a brand of student, a particular brand of researcher. They are developing one thing that you can't find easily is loyalty. Loyalty between the researcher and the end market. Money is not everything. Loyalty is part of the equation that we need to consider. And we can't afford to have half-baked solutions. Shortcuts inver invariably end up in disasters. And the last thing any researcher, any partner wants is failure. Because failure will ov obviously will stop the, uh, uh, the, the, the partnership, but also freezes any possible collaboration in the future with those partners. And indeed, it can be uh, more dramatic than that. Finally, as a university or educational institution, we want to encourage through the partnership training. We want to train the future generation. We also want to retain the people we train because they are our soldiers. If we don't have, you can't fight a war with generals. You need soldiers on the ground. So you need to train the workforce. Continuous development of the workforce, that is the academics, the researcher is critical. The role of the institution in all this is also important because they facilitate the dynamics for any of these agreement, any of these partnership with real tangible result. Unless you have real tangible result, you're not going to get any product, or if you get it, it will not be sustainable, which is the word that we keep hearing. It's to encourage and nurture knowledge generation, which is one of the key points within the 2030 vision, and to provide intellectual protect protection framework. Researchers, scientists need to know that if they invent something, then that something will be looked after and they will be rewarded for it. The mechanism is maybe needs to mature a bit more in some places other than others. But nonetheless, you have to have framework. Sometimes you may even need to, need to educate people in what is protectable or not. To ensure that this, the partnership is successful, we need to uh, have everybody thinking coherently and obviously everybody enthusiastic. And that can only occur if all the partners are treated with impartiality. You don't favor anyone so that everybody feels they are part of this global team if the, 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 the team obviously is international as it is the case on the Qatar Foundation Fund. Finally, we, we need to encourage and assist the protection, exploitation, and commercialization. I've heard it from some senior people in other countries. They are dismayed that their universities, and some have incredibly good universities, that the commercialization rate, rate of findings is very low. People develop technologies, but they sit on the shelf. Commercialization is an integral component for the well-being of the inventor, of the scientist and the researcher. In terms of local research partnerships, obviously we have Qatar Foundation through the QNRF program and through QSTP. We also have our partners in Education City. 
Uh, you've seen some uh, of their representative today. We're also uh, uh, collaborating with the new institutes. Uh, you heard so much about them today, like the Environment and Energy Institute, the, uh, uh, the Computing Research Institute, and so on. We are engaging with anyone. We, we just want to make sure that we harmonize our activities and we make use of all the resources available to us within the country. As such, uh, uh, you've seen some statistics from Dr. Abdestar earlier for global things, but these are the statistics for Qatar University, given in terms of US dollars uh, between millions. So you can see that we've been uh, very lucky, uh, although things are drying up a bit recently because of the 20% success rate. Nonetheless, we've done very well, and you can see tangible results on the ground. The example he quoted earlier about now corridors are populated is happening for us in Qatar University. We have populated labs, we have new equipment, we have staff, uh, recruited researchers from around the world. And it is a very dynamic scenario that we see. And it's actually now, this is being translated into publications, and you can see the statistics in front of you in terms of journal publication and conference publication or contributions. So people are now producing the results. And this is very healthy for the scientists because that's the reward they want to see. With QSTP, we also created centers such as the Qatar University Wireless Innovation Center. It's very successful and uh, uh, is, is dealing with some of the issues such as the environmental issues, such as traffic control to avoid, for example, emission and congestions. On the local research partners, we have a host of partners. I couldn't list them all, but you have the, obviously the big uh, Hamad Medical Corporation, the big oil and gas companies. We also have some of the colleges that were not in education, such just as the College of North Atlantic. These are all people who are working with us on a multiplicity of activities, some at a local level, some uh, in collaboration at international level. Regional research partnership are not mature. It's a fact. Things are improving, but there are issues uh, within the Gulf states in terms of collaboration. Maybe uh, lack of motivation, maybe some lack of uh, commitment. There are signs. We can see the, uh, the Arab Spring spread into this area. Hopefully, we will uh, report some better results in the future. On the international arena, we have collaboration with over 100 universities from around the world. You've seen the statistics, statistics for uh, Qatar Foundation with the map of the world now being uh, populated uh, with the collaborative arrangement with people operating from Qatar. The same applies to us as a university, as a national university. So to align, I apologize, the, um, the presentation has gone a bit weird for, for the top layer, but to align ourselves with the vision of the country, we have reshaped our research structure so that we have now a health uh, uh, priority uh, research area, ICT priority research area, environment research area, energy, materials, and social sciences and humanity. In other words, we're aligning ourselves with the other uh, you know, bodies within uh, the country so that we can develop synergies with them, so that we can operate at a, a level playing field. We have now centers of excellence or for excellence, where I've discussed or explained earlier about the Environmental Studies Center. It's a regional leader, will be a, an international leader very soon because uh, the university is investing highly into that. And that center is developing partnerships across the globe. The Material Technology Unit, which is addressing specific issues for the oil and gas industry, not just in Qatar, but in the region. The Gas Processing Center, which I, uh, I am in charge of, we are engaged in research and development, not only within the state of Qatar, but also at an international level with a host of activities, visiting professors, numerous trainings, uh, numerous projects, and so on. On the uh, other side of the slide, you see we have uh, uh, Qatar Foundation. We have the, uh, in the QSTP, we have uh, the, the Wireless Innovation Center. We have the Social and Economic Survey Research Institute. And we are in the process of developing other institutes. So final thoughts, uh, research funding from QNRF and QSTP 
has been uh, a tonic for us. It has allowed us to develop uh, some of our research activities. This obviously with funding coming from the, the government, uh, it's very, uh, very important to build research collaboration across the uh, uh, Arab uh, world using the Arab Expatriate Scientist Program that was uh, a precursor to what we have now. Uh, the National Research Institutes uh, that we uh, just talked about earlier, such as the Environment and Energy Institute, these have become now the partner of choice for us because of what we have in common, and we are working on uh, low-hanging fruits. Uh, the doctoral program that I described earlier is eventually is the icing on the cake for us, because if we can produce scientists at that level that will sustain the research for long term, uh, then we are in, uh, in good shape for the future. I thank you for your attention.